Okay. Uh, hang on. Right. Welcome to our next edition of Think Like an Explorer. And in this one, it's going to be all about project management, expeditions in particular, and post mortems and pre mortems, and what we can do to make them run more smoothly. So, Nigel, you're just home. Where have you been? What did you do? How did it go? Um, well, I've been on to uh, the eastern side of Greenland on the ice out doing something called the Iceman Polar Race. Very nice. So that's um, skiing in any kind of ski you like, as long as you can go uphill and down dale. So you could use touring skis, off-piece skis, cross-country skis. That's your choice, and we can talk mm -hmm. about that. Not sufficient for four or five days, depending on whatever over a set course and basically first one to the end wins. it is a race and um, teams of three or four and basically you know you're out there you, you set the course you you go with it you live with the weather and the conditions of the people and the gear and hopefully we all come back safe and for once i'm in one piece <laughs> oh well done that's that's an improvement um how first. long is the race well this is an interesting thing we're going to talk about because it should be four continuous days and then they build one day of bad weather contingency in, and we all know what the weather does. So we actually did have two days stuck in our tents in a blizzard in about a four six. Um, we pitched the tents on the surface, and by the end of day one, there was a two foot drift up the right hand side of them. And by the end of day two, it was about three foot six deep. So you're having to get out no matter what, dig, clear the tents. My pulk or sledge. Um, as people might know them, actually became completely submerged at one point. I had to go down with the ski, bashing it through the floor until it went clang, and it was under two foot snow. So that obviously changes things, and we had to put the race down a day because people were not going to be able to get back to the start or finish line physically in time because of the weather loss. Correct. Right. That sounds interesting. So what, what I was interested in talking about today was, given that it's now happened, given what you know, what would you have done differently in terms of preparing equipment, training, whether it was a good idea to do it at all? Okay, so kind of what did you learn? And do you think there's any way that you could have known that beforehand to given you, give you a better experience? Well, I'll, I'll break it down. I've done a bit of sort of note taking in. I'll break it down into some sections first, Cathy. And, and the biggest one, and you've had a, a little bit of an episode recently, is equipment. Right. Because as, we're, as we are in the outdoors, we have our own stash of gear. And I know we've talked about this before, where um, you get used to things. And I certainly, with my injuries on my feet, get very used to the boots I wear. And I've worn them for years, and I still came home with horrendous blisters. And I can't quite explain why. Uh, I thought I'd had a bad time. One of the guys I noticed around social networking has been to A and E and is now on crutches with blisters. Blisters, oh god! Blisters. I'm oh, talking god. blisters in English, two inches across in um, metric, five centimeters across. Um, mine aren't that bad, but his were. And two people were actually skidded out after two days. Their feet were that bad. And I was surprised at that because I've worn the same boots and I've toured and skied in them for many years and they've been absolutely fine. And I can't put a finger on what it was that got me because I've done this tons before and on the same skis in similar conditions, but it got me. The skis, it's so easy to post-mortem this where some people found that a more touring ski worked than a more lightweight um, wide, not quite an off-piece ski, but something a bit wider. But so much of that is based on conditions of the snow when you get there. Because the very narrow touring skis are no good in powder. And in Greenland, overnight, you can get slabs of powder. As it happened, the top surface crust was pretty hard. So the people with the thin skis actually performed better, except for the downhills. Um, but it was such an undulating course that some of the downhills weren't actually down in a hill enough to ski with a pulk on. I did some of the sections. 
But again, how do you take that choice? The weather is so variable. And my view is I, I would prefer to take something I know and I'm used to. And my skis work very, very well. My skins work very, very well. Um, and a lot of that is down to prep, making sure they're glued properly. If people understand skins under skis, make sure that the glue works. And it's good. You know, these are not old ratty things that you found in the undergrowth. Make sure they're of a good quality because going uphill without them is not funny where there's a hundred pound sledge behind you towing you backwards. So that was the basic bottom kit. Insulating kit for me was fine. I have to get my gloves specially made because of that. They worked really well. Mm -hmm. uh, and generally equipment wise, other than those, it worked very, very well. We had to advise a few people though, race or not, one chap on the first day on a glacier didn't bother wearing sunglasses. And then wondered by halfway through the day, got a headache. You've just got to say to somebody, please just put some eye protection on. Otherwise, I think I'll be ill. Never mind you. <laughs> um, and I think having the years of experience, kit went well. Kit went very well otherwise. It was just the boots that um, got me. But I think what, what, and if you want to talk about this, Cathy, with your skis today, you've got to go out and extensively test this gear. It's no good turning up with brand new kit on the hill and expecting it to work tomorrow because we need to go and give it a good sorting out to make sure nothing's wrong with it. Although that being said, now what Marjorie's referring to is I was skiing a 45 degree cool water today in my local mountains and had my ski binding break halfway down the cool water. I've skied on these for two winter seasons. These are not new ski bindings, nor are they ancient. So there was a piece of kit that I thought was well broken in you know of all the different things i was actually testing today it was the new uh, expedition ski boots which are bigger and thicker and warmer than what i would normally use yeah. uh, and putting them together with the crampons and so on that i was interested in it did not occur to me that my bindings were in any sense uh, a weak part of the kit mm. and they they could just as easily have failed a week from now when we were already out on mount logan which is a pretty remote place Yes, very, very. But Kathy, if you were going on the expedition different to a day skiing, would you carry enough bits and bobs to carry out a repair if you had to? Yeah, well, we're carrying basic repair kit, but I mean, the, the heel block sheared into two pieces, a top and bottom piece. Right. You can't repair that in the field. Uh, what we are doing, we consider taking a spare set of skis, but that's quite a big weight and size addition so we're taking a set of expedition snowshoes okay. as our backup in case someone either loses a ski which happens or uh, we have binding failure yeah. but of course it's you know it's a lot harder to climb that mountain on snowshoes than it is on ski so it, it'll get you out of the, the mountain but it may not get you up the mountain which of course then has a whole lot of other issues because we're two tenths of three basically on a team of six yeah. Which limits your options for splitting the group as well. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, th there were some people climbing in the Stony Alps in Greenland uh, last year who um, got the lost their skis and had to walk out. I think were mildly avalanche and lost their gear. You know, and you know what it's like trying to walk out with snow that's waist deep. It, it's a joke. It, it just doesn't happen, which is why we're on skis. Um, but I don't think that's an unreasonable thing to say, Cathy, because even if it's one pair of space no shoes between the six of you, It'll get somebody out if they have to. It gets you home and it gets you down if it has to. And I think that's that's vital. I think that really is right in a place like that. Well, I think some of the stuff we've been talking about, though, is the uncertainty of the event. Mm -hmm. It's impossible to have gear be 100% foolproof in these tough conditions. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the challenges you've talked about so far were weather-related. And as you said, you couldn't tell mm -hmm. if you were going to get X weather, you'd have wanted one kind of kit. If you've got Y weather, you'd have got something else. And you take your best guess based on what you're comfortable with, what you own, yeah. and go out there and see. Yeah. Was there anything else in the way the that challenge went down that you think you could have done better in retrospect? Well, team building. Certainly for me, because mm -hmm. I am an individual, um, when, the, when the race first was announced, I approached a number of people asking if they were interested. And the long and short of it was that everybody said no. 
I said, well, you know, I don't want to be Billy No Mates just quite. I would like to take part in the event. And I talked to the organisers and they said, well, you're not on your own. We have got a number of people who are ones and twos. Would you be happy if we put some teams together? Absolutely fine. Yeah, you know, let's do that. Now, I'm not sure what that is. I can hear some googling. Um, <laughs> oh, don't worry. It's just my pipes in the background. <laughs> <laughs> you cat again. Um, team, team building or team effort, because I was put with two individuals who were, excuse the phrase, balls apart. And in a team of three, you've got one individual who's sort of, shall we say, very positive and one very negative in a magnetic sense. And they were right. very happy to disagree with each other, but they didn't particularly want to disagree with each other, each other. They wanted to use me as the middleman. And that was an interesting time, I'll tell you. Um, because uh, we had one individual who was very, very struggling. He struggled a bit the first day with his back and his and uh, whatever else. Um, and these things happen, you know, you're pulling a sledge. And I said, right, if you're going to struggle like that, whatever else, we'll put you at the front tomorrow. You dictate the pace. The other two of us will be behind you. You know, the age old thing, because we don't want to be two miles apart on the glass. You were a team effort. Brilliant. So I put the other chap at the front the next day, and then he proceeded to speed off so fast that the other two of us couldn't keep up with him. So it's the old team dynamic issue, Cathy, that I know you know very well. Um, we, we've done a bit of a post-mortem on this, even before we got off the ice cap uh, with the organisers. Mm -hmm. We all talk about it, and it's not easy sometimes, depending on where people live, but we've got to get folk together, if we can, before we fly out. Something like an event like this, we don't have time. You know, if you've got a week's walk into the mountain to get to know people, to break down how other people work, to work out who you might climb with, we haven't got that time. And I've um, started writing a report to the organisers. Part of some of that being, you've got to get folk together beforehand, and they've got to be, unless the three people really know each other, we need to get that team dynamic right. We haven't got time for arguments. We haven't got time for people moaning at each other or not wanting to get up early because they don't want to put the stove on. You know, this is a team event. We've got to act like a team and all come out with smiles on our faces. And I found that, you know, the usual age old battle that it always is trying to keep the peace and keep people moving in difficult times. But I mean, realistically, you could have predicted that. Oh, absolutely. But, but one team member I knew and one I didn't. You know, one I was going in completely blind. You can research on the internet, you can chat on the phone. Um, you might think, I can get on with this person, I can get on with that person, but it's a triangular piece, Cathy, where those two come together. And that was really hard. So you're saying that effectively, I mean, clearly you knew, you knew it was going to be a challenge going with people who didn't know that well. Yeah. But you worked on the basis that you can get on with two people for four days, you know, yeah. almost anybody in theory. Yeah. Whereas the reality is... In that very tough situation, particularly if the two of them don't get on with each other. So it's not actually about you, it's about you being trapped between the two of them. Mm -hmm. And and we're all there for the same outcome. Um, it, it's a trap it's very easy to fall into where we all think we're looking for the same outcome, so we all ought to work in a similar fashion. And of course, not everybody works like that. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's an interesting point. The way we assume that because Basically, we want X outcome and we think about achieving that outcome in a certain way that other people who also appear to want the same outcome will therefore think in the same way and they don't. They don't. Absolutely. They, they, can, Absolutely. they can be thinking very differently about how to get there, why they want to get there, what they consider an acceptable route and risk and sacrifice to get there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that's something that was... Uh... A real interest, I'll tell you. Um, but we all know that battle. We've had it many times ourselves. Um, information changed a lot as well on the event. And getting the information to and from people actually worked reasonably well because of the flexibility of most of us having worked in Greenland before. Mm -hmm. it, it's very easy to um, put down in, you know, anybody can write a Gantt chart out and say we did this in this time and we, we predicted that there would probably be bad weather and there was but communication actually worked very well and the reason that was and this was something that worked it was organised pre and post very effectively 
was that it will be a set course with set campsites. The reason being you can't manage effectively four or five teams of people spread over 10 miles on um, mental evacuation. We've got to consider polar bear attack. Uh, we've got to consider safety of camps. Uh, and the organisers made a choice of this will be the camp for that day and we'll just set times between camp A and camp B. And if somebody gets in at three, the clock stops. And if somebody gets in at six at night, the clock stops. Uh, purely so they could manage it. Otherwise, I think we have people all over the ice. And I think that was a very good move. Uh, something I certainly would have done, Cathy, to try and you know keep people together. And um, only two days after I got back, um, a group out there just had two polar bears circling them in the night. And, you know, joking apart, it's a very, very serious issue. Um, you can manage it better when there's 12 or 14 of you in one camp than all being split up into small groups. It's interesting because, I mean, it is um, dumbing down the event. I mean, it is no longer you start at a, finish, at, at a line and see who turns up at the end two or three or four days later, however fast they can move and however long or short they camp. It is. Um, the issue being, I think, just on a on a pure ground from the organisers, I think with it being the first event of its kind, I think they were really overcautious. Because I don't think they want, the last thing they want is on the event, somebody got a broken leg and had a nightmare. Um, we've all got sat phones, we've all got uh, spot trackers, we've all got e we've got all the usual kit, that's absolutely fine if we need to make the call. Um, but obviously, um, you can hit the cautious button sometimes, and I think they may have just hit it a little bit too hard on this event. Is it something you do again? The race? Um, yeah. I've thought about it because they've already put next year's dates out, um, but I'd want a major change in route because they can't do the same route. That's pointless to me. And I'd want a change in tactics and team. One of the major issues, however, with this neck of the woods is air transport the commercial flights to this part of Greenland have been pulled. So you've got to charter aircraft on specific days from specific people. And if they're not prepared to do that or costings, you've got to fly the entire team in, the entire expedition in on an aircraft and fly them out. And they tend to be in week stamps, Wednesday to Wednesday, which of course restricts you on the ice. So you've either got to make it a two week event or you know, ten days on the ice, or you're stuck within that Wednesday Wednesday time scale. And for me, I think that's a bit too close. I wouldn't be too interested in that speed again. I'd, I'd want to go something a bit longer. Yeah, it's a long way to go for basically a week. Yeah, it is. It is, Kathy, because you, you fly to Iceland, you drive five hours across Iceland, you fly two hours to Greenland. It's hell of a way. Well, the commercial flight stopped a few years ago, and it's been a real thorn in the side of people working up there, purely because they're not being able to govern well there's a, there's a standard flight comes in three times a week we can throw anybody on that job done you know it's it's a it's a different kettle of fish now and it's it's not where there's any other way to get to mm. yeah when you're having to hire a point not to, it's not a cheap business yeah yeah fair enough one of the things that interests me about this process is the, to what extent we can take what you and i've just been doing now which is doing a post-mortem on a project, uh, look back at it and say, well, this went wrong because that and that went wrong because the other and some things couldn't have been changed like weather and some of them could like the team dynamic. Uh, although you'd possibly have to have just chosen not to have participated at all. And then how, to what extent can you bring that round to the front of a project and do something that I've seen referred to uh, in project management as a pre-mortem? Mm -hmm. Sit, sit people down and say, right, imagine this is post-expedition. Imagine that it went wrong. Mm -hmm. What's the first thing that comes to mind? Because in doing that, freeing people up uh, to think creatively about what happened, if they yeah. will, there's a good chance that they will jump to the weakest place in the expedition planning. They're like, oh, well, if it all goes to hell, clearly it's going to be probably X. And then you have a chance to sit down as a group and go like, hmm, okay, X. Can we actually do something about that? Um, is there a way we can kind of 
predict hindsight and then use it to change what might happen in the expedition. Do you think you could have managed anything like that with your trip? Could you have think, seen some of the problems coming? I think um, from an organisational point of view, from the people that work in Greenland, they know the country, they know the route because they planned it. Um, so a lot of these things they could sit down with afterwards. I think there was probably an awful lot of juggling too many balls at once. And also, and it's an age old problem is you've got to sometimes give jobs to other people. And um, I've worked with some industries where people take out, take all the responsibility on, which is lovely. It's fine if that's what you want to do, but hell's bells, you're bringing yourself a lot of work onto your doorstep and you've got to deliver it. Whereas it's nice to be able to spread that um, workload out. And I think that's something they should have learned beforehand. Um, the, the age old thing, though, Kathy, is that you do the post-mortem and you've got to use that as the pre-mortem for the next event and with extra parts. You mustn't just say, well, we've had a lovely post-mortem. We've made a lovely report. We shove it in a folder and we'll never look at it ever again because I've seen that too many times. Yes, I think that's a fair point, although it does then leave you going into the next project busy solving the problems of the last project. And if you're not careful, you, you know, you are now solving the wrong problems or failing to notice the ways in which the new project is not simply a rerun. Yes, and I, and I don't know what next year's plan is. Um, it could be a rerun. It might not physically, but you're right. Um, the thing is, though, you can bring out, let's say you brought out from uh, this experience, take an example, five salient points that you do need to address. You know, don't make 50, you'll never do it. Um, if they were the big five, relate to them, learn by them. Don't just do, as I say, I've seen so many, write a nice report, shove it in a cabinet, forget about it and start from scratch again. I mean, we've been doing trips for years, Cathy. How many times do we sit down and went, what went wrong last time? What did I learn? Why won't I do it again? And I'm, because and things do go wrong, we know that, but we can make those judgment calls based on experience. The first event is a toughie. Yes, I must admit, I do write those lists and I, I, I do tend not to be able to find the list a year later when the time comes to, to move on to the next project. But forgetting the organisers for a bit, what would be, don't take five, take three. What's on your list of three things not to do, you know, if you end up with something similar in the future or do differently? Certainly differently. Um, I would knock the other two's head together quite hard very early. Um, and say, look, if you two don't talk to each other right now, I will knock your heads together. Um, certainly, I'd want a pre-expedition meeting, which not, none of us could do because we're all over the world at the time. Um, even as, You could do something like this. You could put us on a blood room, three of us at once, and chat. Um, even if it's just to get people's perspective and thoughts of what they want out of the event and how they think they're going to achieve that as an individual and as a team. Because straight away you can start looking at, hmm, this person probably wants more than I do or less than I do. I think that would have been vital, Cathy. Otherwise, the actual event itself went fine. Um, I would have perhaps wanted to do more for my feet which you probably find surprising from somebody like me who does nothing but handle the damn things and keep playing with them. I still cannot understand why they have been problematic, and I need to quite seriously look at that. I'm at hospital next week with them. I'm not going to stick them on the screen. You'll be ill. Um, but I need to have... I need to understand that more, even after all my time with my injuries. I need to understand what went wrong there and, and why, so I don't do it again. And also... Uh, I'll expand my medical kit because of that, because there's the age old problem that we just forget what's in there and we don't update it when new stuff comes out. And I need to have a look at that. Um, and finally, go on, sorry. Um, I was going to say what what interests me is. Um, I'm at the beginning of this. Yeah. Uh, running a pre-mortem to your post-mortem. Yeah. And trying to predict the ways in which I think our team while expedition project might fail. Yeah. Uh, to Cindy's question about how well I know the team members, I've, there's six of us, 
I've ski toured in the Alps with two of them. Mm -hmm. And three of them are new to me. We've been planning this for a couple of months. So I've had some interaction with everybody. And I think all but one I've met face to face. But it's interesting, even in the planning. So there's the one team member who just never answers email. Yeah, I've had that. And, you know, okay, so in that case, I have skied with this person. So I know that in the field, it's fine. But it is fairly frustrating when everyone else is making group decisions and this individual has simply vanished. So that's, it means everyone is going in slightly on edge uh, with this particular person. And then another one who's just, I think he'd really rather we'd simply stop the clock in the 1970s. He doesn't want GPS. He doesn't want satellite communications. He, you know, uh, and we're taking all of those things. And we're taking solar panels to power them and so on. And there's a certain discomfort with his disdain for some of this stuff, despite the fact that the rest of it will be using it. And we'll end up doing the navigation off the GPSs. I mean, I don't see him doing, you know, dead reckoning on his compass in the middle of a, a Yukon blizzard. Um, he'll be more than happy for GPSs to come out while still being rather snooty about it all. And again, that's something the rest of us go into the expedition somewhat on edge yeah. uh, with this person already. Yeah. So there's, there's even though we are, we do know each other more or less, and we are effectively friends, and hopefully we share a common goal. I can see little edges in the group already. Yeah. And the other thing that I think may be our splitting point is two tenths of three. Which means, which. which I mean, it makes sense. It makes sense for a whole lot of reasons. It's good for weight. It's good for warmth. It's good for sociability. It's good for communication. But it makes it harder to split the group. It does, Kathy. And also, it makes a big difference on which three in which tent. Um, because it, it's all well when you're out on the ice, if you are... Um, pulling your sledge, carrying a rucksack, you can lose your thoughts, you can do things. But when you're all cluttering into a tent um, and piling your gear in and cooking at night and all the things that we know well, it really does help if your tent gets on fantastically. And um, I, th this recent race, I mean, one of the team members in my tent, you say, didn't respond to emails much, um, just went uh, you know off off the end of the digital world we can all say it's grumpy old and even i'm a bit grumpy old you know that um but some people just think i've made a decision that's it why do i need to keep telling you why do you need to keep asking um i found though you know you'll 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 know well the fact of you've got to get the right people in the tent at the right time having sat for five days in a storm once on baffin I had a guy with me I'd known for years and we got on like a house on fire. But after five days, even we were getting a bit cabin feverish. Whereas we had two guys over the other side of the camp, because about six tents on it, who didn't know each other. And we had to take one of them out of the tent and take them skiing round the camp for an hour before they killed each other. Wow. Um, God. Well, that's all very encouraging to listen to. No, that's not really. But, but what I'm saying is it, it's the cabin fever thing when you're on your own or you're climbing in pairs you're not on top of each other physically all the time if you want to blow something off you can do it 100 yards away when you're stuck in a tent and there's nowhere to go it can happen yes, you only have I mean, to have somebody spill a cup of tea on top of an argument and that's it the whole thing just blows up it is actually a situation with where one hand three people means that you can take a break from the pair dynamic and how very, very, very much you start to dislike your pair. But on the other hand, three people triangulate. Yeah. And if one person, one person can get frozen out by the other two, uh, and then if you've got one happy tent and one unhappy tent, the happy tent absolutely doesn't want to be asked to split up to try and improve the dynamic of the unhappy tent. The other thing that's slightly annoying about being a woman is just the assumption in this team, four men, two women, oh, well, the two women will obviously share a tent and then we'll work out the rest of them. It's like, why? Um, is there some inherent femaleness that requires us to, to be in the same tent? No, there isn't. So I find that slightly annoying. Yeah. Uh, 
when working with guys? I mean, we had mixed teams. Some were two girls and a chap in a tent. Others were two lads and a girl. Everybody just got on with it, frankly. There was no fact that there was, the teams were of three and three-man tents work. That'll do. Thank you very much. Get in. Well, exactly. We have that situation. All tents have to be mixed because there are only two women in their three people tents. Yeah. But there's still the assumption that somehow the two girls must go together. And then um, we, we work out the rest. So I think we've more or less run through our time. The challenge is going to be to see whether my predictions about what might go wrong on our expedition turn out to be accurate, yeah. uh, or whether I'm going to come back and report in six weeks' time, because I'm going to be off the air and out of communication at this point until early June, right. and come back and report on a completely different set of utterly unexpected, disastrous <laughs> outcomes. <laughs> Hopefully not. Let's hope not. And let's say you have a very safe and successful trip as well. Pat. Oh, thank you. Yes. It's a beautiful place. So hopefully just the experience of being out there will be worth it, however far we do or do not get on the mountain. Yeah. That's one thank thing you. I'll say about Greenland. Regardless, you know, you've only got to turn a corner and I'll, it's the most unbelievable scenery you can ever imagine. If nothing else, you can be having the worst time in your life. You've only got to open your eyes and the world is good. It really, really is. Well, I just hope the weather's good enough that we can see that the world is good. Um, <laughs> it's when you can't see a damn thing and you might as well be sitting, you know, in the, in the Cairngorm somewhere in awful weather, um, where at least then you could go down and get to the bar once you got home. Um, that's when it's challenging. Right. So I'm going to be out for the next six weeks, so we will need to have a quick discussion about how, where we're going to go in that time period. Okay. Uh, but I think for today, we're done. Really? Thank, Thank you very much, much for joining today.